Senator Welch. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this hearing is extremely important, but I also think it's in the context of the conclusion that I'm coming to, and that is that we have a crisis on the Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court has a duty, is to strengthen our democracy and strengthen respect for the rule of law. Yet the United States Supreme Court, in many recent decisions, has, in my view, become a threat to democracy, and it has profoundly eroded respect for the rule of law. <clears throat> it's not just polls of American people that show a record low respect for the court, confidence in the court. It's not a popularity contest, of course. But the court has been making decisions with outcomes that are very contrary to the public interest. That's a point of view, but I think one that can be backed up with evidence. But it's also been using intellectual manipulation in reaching its decisions. And I think the public gets that. It's not on the level. Let me give three examples. <clears throat> we have a corrupt campaign finance system. Again, in the Supreme Court and Citizens United, made an assertion of facts that I'll talk about in a minute to justify unleashing unlimited money, unaccountable money, undisclosed money to pollute our political process. In the Bruin decision, the United States Supreme Court came up with a framework of analysis, so-called historical analysis, which essentially made up a history of the way back to disregard the reality of today. And in the Dobbs decision, the Supreme Court disregarded precedent in stare decisis in order to achieve an outcome that we're now living with. The Supreme Court itself has added flames to the fire when some of those justices were before this committee in this room, Mr. Chairman, on this question of precedent, one justice told the committee in 2020, I will obey all the rules of stare decisis and agreed that Roe was super precedent. In 2018, another justice told the committee that Roe is an important precedent in the Supreme Court, which was, it has been reaffirmed many times. And in 2017, still another justice told this committee of Roe quote, a good judge will consider precedent of the U.S. Supreme Court as worthy of treatment like any other. And of course, we've also had recently the report of ProPublica about the ethical issues in the Supreme Court. So I have two concerns. I don't know if I'll have time. But one is uh, for Professor Goodwin about what I would regard as the departure from the doctrine of judicial restraint to a doctrine of judicial flexibility to achieve outcomes of the court. And the second is for Mr. Ms. Zorowski, who thank you for being here. You've spoken about your, your own experience. But there's moms who've lost kids because we are not allowed to pass gun safety legislation that meets the Supreme Court muster. They're citizens who are in agony about their democracy being ruled by folks who can give multi-million dollar contributions. And there's women like you who are suffering because they've lost access to the health care that they need. So I'll start with you, Professor Goodwin. Thank you very much, Senator Welch, for your question. As you mentioned, the outcome determinative of the Dobbs decision, and you're absolutely right. One day before in the Bruin decision written by Justice Thomas, Justice Thomas said that a prologue was necessary to understand the history 
of men and their bodily autonomy, specifically black men. He spent five paragraphs in the Bruin decision describing black men historically discrimination against them during slavery and Jim Crow and how their bodily autonomy mattered and how gun safety or having guns was important to that. You will not find a prologue mentioning anything about women in the Dobbs decision. Two words that you will not find in the Dobbs decision, black woman or black women. Together, you will not find five paragraphs that speak to the forced and voluntary nature of reproduction of black women during slavery being forced into pregnancies. You will not read anything about black maternal mortality in the Dobbs decision. So one day before, five paragraphs devoted to it in the Dobbs decision, absolutely nothing. And as we look at this kind of turn <coughs> to history, as you've mentioned, it's selective, it's opportunistic, it cherry picks through history. Let me just say this, Roe v. Wade was a seven to two decision. Five of those seven justices were Republican appointed. Prescott Bush, the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. In the Roe v. Wade decision, what Justice Blackman mentioned, and is absolutely right, abortion had not been criminalized in the United States. The pilgrims had performed abortion, so had indigenous people. When abortion becomes criminalized in this country, it was leading to and around the time of the Civil War. And we see some of the same rhetoric today used then, Thank the you. concern about the browning of the United States. And that was the impetus for early abortion laws during the time of the Civil War. And we see the same kind of rhetoric today. Thank you. My time is up, but I don't know if we can allow Ms. Arowski just to speak on briefly on behalf of essentially the um, federal damage of these decisions. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to address this repeated attempt by the Republicans at a vulgar mischaracterization <coughs> of what someone who needs an abortion looks like. Um, frankly, it's stigmatizing, it's offensive, and it's unrealistic, and it doesn't reflect who needs an abortion or who wants an abortion in this country. And quite frankly, healthcare should not be a meritocracy. You shouldn't have to deserve healthcare in order to access it in this country. And what's going on is not an accident. As I mentioned before, when Dobbs first came down, the Biden administration put out guidance on who should and could receive an abortion. And in Texas, in my home state, um, Attorney General Ken Paxton sued over that guidance. And so that guidance was revoked. And so again, as I said before, what happened to me was intentional. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman.